Welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 76. A Master at Work. The Plays of Lupe de Vega. The last episode in the Renaissance Theatre timeline was all about the full and rather exciting life of the master of Spanish Renaissance Theatre, Lupe de Vega. Now it's time to look at his plays and try to understand why he's regarded as the best Spanish playwright of the period by a long way. His prolific work and the sheer variety of his output leaves anyone trying to sum up his work with a problem. It is quite similar to the problem of trying to sum up his life that had so many diverse and apparently contradictory events and his character that is similarly difficult to pin down. For all of these contradictions and perhaps because of them, no other playwright summed up the age so effectively. Aubrey Bell put it well when he said, For half a century his sensitive, impressionable genius was the ready channel through which the spirit of the triumphant Spanish nation could flow and the classic drama became fully nationalised. He added play to play, no single play represents his genius, but in their entirety they fully represent the Spanish nation. So I don't disagree with that, but I am going to attempt to give you a flavour of the breadth of Lopez's work by looking at some individual plays, which is an approach that I recognise has some shortcomings. I'm going to try to mix talking about the general and typical themes of his plays with specific plot summaries that illustrate these points well, but also make sure that you get a good sense of what the plays were actually like when they were performed. Given the scale of his output, this will inevitably be just a small window onto his world. I've tried to select plays that are good general illustrations or have some specific interest that I felt was worth highlighting. But even a curated shortlist of his plays would be very long, so there are omissions and any shortcomings are, as usual, of my own making, as I try to balance concision with depth. Enough said, let's get on with it. A work of Lopez that is still performed today in Spain is the comedy The Gardener's Dog, written in 1618. The title is reference to the proverbial dog in a manger, meaning someone who takes possession of something that's of no real use to them, but by doing so prevents others benefiting from the use of it. It's a story that has Greek origins, and Lope takes the Spanish version that had developed over the years. In that retelling, a gardener trains his dog to guard his field where he grows cabbages, or lettuces, depending on which version you read. The dog is assiduous in his task, and even when his master dies, he won't let anybody enter the field. That gives rise to the saying, he's like the gardener's dog, who eats no cabbage, but won't let others either. Or in a shorthand form, one could be accused of playing the gardener's dog. In the play, the Countess, Diana, is enraged when she hears that a man has been seen leaving the upper chambers of her palace. His identity remains a mystery, as, realising that he was discovered, he cleverly threw his cap at the only candle, plunging his hasty exit into darkness. She sends for her ladies-in-waiting and questions them to learn who has been visited by a lover during the night. Dorotea and Anarada plead innocence, but secretly tell her that another of her waiting ladies, Marcella, has a lover in the palace. They identify him as Teodoro, the Countess's own private secretary. Questioned by the Countess, Marcella confesses her love, but protests that it is a pure love and Teodoro wants to marry her. The Countess gives her consent to the marriage, but cautions Marcella to stay away from Teodoro until the wedding day to avoid the risk of passion overcoming honour. After her ladies leave her alone, Diana realises that she too loves Teodoro, but since he's not highborn, she can't proclaim her love for him. Teodoro, who had indeed been the man involved in the midnight rendezvous, fears that he will be found out and banished, or even executed, but he cannot get Marcella out of his heart or mind. Tristan, his servant, begs him to forget Marcella and never see her again, lest the Countess punish them. It turns out that it was Tristan who threw the cap and snuffed out the candle, so that his master wouldn't be recognised while escaping. Later, Diana tricks Tristan into revealing his part in the affair, but desperate to help his own standing with the Countess, he counters by suggesting that in fact Teodoro is of noble birth. 
Aware that this is probably not true, but nevertheless encouraged, the Countess wastes no time in sending for Teodoro. She subtly hints of her love for him in a letter that she pretends is intended for someone else, but is in fact about him. Marcella goes to Teodoro and tells him that her mistress has blessed their betrothal. Confused, Teodoro takes Marcella in his arms just as Diana appears. When he thanks her for giving Marcella to him, the Countess is overtaken by a fit of jealousy and orders Marcella to be locked in her room to await her decision concerning the wedding. Alone again with Teodoro, the Countess again hints that she loves him, whereupon he renounces Marcella. He regrets rejecting his lover, but he cannot put aside the lure of wealth and power that will be his if he were to become husband to a countess. After Marcella is released from the locked room, she goes to Teodoro, but he rejects her, spurns her love and by doing so, disgraces her. Marcella swears revenge on him and on Anarada, who has, she learns, betrayed her and Teodoro to the countess, and all because Anarada mistakenly thinks that Marcella has been encouraging Fabio, a gentleman with whom Anarada is in love. Marcella, on meeting Fabio, dramatically offers him her love in an attempt at some revenge on Anarada, something that comes to him completely unexpectedly and causes much confusion in the young man. When two noblemen, the Marquis Ricardo and Count Federigo, arrive to beg for the hand of the Countess, she sends for Teodoro to tell Ricardio that she chooses him for her husband. Deserted by the Countess before she was really his, Teodoro turns back to Marcella and tells her that he loves only her. At first she spurns him and declares she will marry Fabio, but in the end cannot resist her true feelings and true love wins over all other concerns. So, The Gardener's Dog is a story of the emotional complications of class conflict, where the barriers to love are primarily class and those in the upper reaches of society are essentially shown as being single-mindedly selfish and thoughtlessly cruel in the pursuit of their desires. It is a consistent trait of Lopez's plays that his sympathies lie with those of lower origins. More often than not, it is they who triumph, not necessarily in a material way, but with finding true happiness in life, which is usually achieved by finding true love. Diana's acceptance of Teodoro as of noble birth mocks the gentry in Spanish society, who, Lope is saying, are only concerned with how things look on the surface, and that, by implication, their ranks are infiltrated by those they accept, but are not really worthy of the position, making them all look rather foolish. The character of Tristran is an important one to Lope. Tristran is gracioso, the buffoon. The name very simply translates to funny. Lope is sometimes credited with the creation of that character type, but in fact it stretches back to the wily servant or slave of Roman comedy. Lope reintroduced it as a fixture of his plays as primarily a comic character, but clever and a character who also plays a crucial part in the plot. The resolution of the play is quite forced, as is typical of Lopez's plays, with Marcella abandoning her annoyance at Teodoro and ignoring his very obvious character flaws as she succumbs to her love for him. As this is a comedy, the happy ending is expected and, as we know from his life story, the finding of true love between the sexes was important to Lope, even if for the audience at the Corral he shows it in a more conventional way than he did in his own life. For an example of tragedy by Lope de Vega, we can turn to Punishment Without Vengeance. This is a late work written in 1631 when Lope was 68. For this play, he turned to the ancient themes of the effects of adultery and relationships that verge on the incestuous, in this case between stepmother and stepson. The setting is Ferrara, where the Duke, well known for his dissolute life, is persuaded to disinherit his illegitimate son, the Count Federico, and marry quickly to produce a legal heir and secure his line. His intended is Cassandra, and he sends Federico out from the palace to greet her as she approaches. As he meets her carriage, it becomes stuck in a river ford, and he rescues her, falling in love with her in the process. On his return to the palace, Federico discovers that his father has arranged for him to marry his niece Aurora, which will enable him to keep his position at court despite his disinheritance. 
Federico struggles with hiding his feelings for Cassandra and finding excuses to postpone the wedding to Aurora, who in turn becomes frustrated and not a little suspicious, so she encourages the attentions of Gonzaga, who arrived at the court as part of Cassandra's retinue. Meanwhile, Cassandra is finding disappointment in married life at court. The Duke has not changed his ways and shows her little attention while she hears reports of his philandering. When he leaves to take up arms with the Pope, she finds his absence a relief. With Federico acting as regent, she gives herself to him, an act that's witnessed by Aurora thanks to a conveniently positioned mirror. The Duke returns early and unexpectedly. The harrowing experience of battle have made him a changed man. He is handed an anonymous letter that details the affair between his son and his wife, but refuses to believe it until he sees them embracing. Unwilling to bring the affair out in public, something that might tarnish his own honour, he struggles to think of how he might punish them, and eventually decides that he can be rid of them both through what will look like a political murder. He lures Cassandra into a room, binds her in a chair, gags her and covers her with a blanket. He then goes to Federico and tells him that he has discovered a plot by a nobleman to murder him. He orders Federico to kill the captured man. Federico is reluctant but eventually complies. As he discovers with horror who he has actually killed, the Duke and his courtiers burst into the room and the Duke loudly accuses Federico of murdering his wife. The courtiers fall on Federico with daggers drawn. This is not an original story. Lope probably based his play on a novel that had been published recently and that in turn borrows heavily from the Hippolytus Phaedra myth that was well known via Seneca and before that through Euripides. In my brief summary, the tragedy sounds rather made up and lacking in the psychological depths of the greatest tragedies of the age. This is no Hamlet or Macbeth. But it does have some interesting subtleties that we might miss. It's a play with three protagonists, the Duke, his son and his wife. And for Lope, each deserves an element of our sympathy. The Duke may be a womaniser and dissolute in his ways, but he recognises his duty to produce a legitimate heir to ensure the stability of his lands. We may feel this carries little weight against his moral failures, but at the time, this would have been seen as a redeeming feature by many. Our sympathies are with Federico, as he is disinherited but he shows none of the qualities expected from an heir apparent, so any feelings the contemporary audience might have had for this situation were tempered by this. Cassandra is also a less than sympathetic character, and quick to fall in with Federico, going hard against the expected behaviours of the time. The triangle at the centre of this play gives it an ironic twist, where none of the protagonists are heroic or particularly likeable. They're close to anti-heroes, leaving the audience with mixed and uncertain feelings towards them. Even though the incest in the play is tempered by the step relationship of Cassandra and Federico, this would still have been very shocking for the time. In Renaissance period Europe, family relationships were very significant, with extended blood relations and relations by marriage, providing an extensive network of support both in business and in social relationships. By commencing an affair with each other, and Lope shows Cassandra as equally complicit in this, they are committing a serious moral and social sin. In this way, the tragedy is as serious as many others, but apart from the final deaths, it lacks the violence of many in the genre. Lope also had an eye on contemporary events when he reworked the story, although we can't be quite sure which specific events he was echoing. The story has a tenuous grounding in facts of the reign of Duke d'Este Niccolò III in the 1420s. And there are also parallels with the biblical story of King David. But the fact that the play was withdrawn after just one performance gives some credence to the theory that it rather too closely reflected the stories that were still being circulated about Carlos, the son of Philip II, and Isabel, Philip's third wife. It's possible that this was too close to the bone for Philip IV and his court, and the play was tactfully withdrawn. It is tempting to think that the attitudes of the characters that Lope drew reflect his own beliefs. That is always a dangerous game, but given what we know about his life, the ideas he expressed in his poetry and other works, and his prolific output, in this case, it is probably true. 
Like any author, he was a chameleon who could adopt personas for in his characters. But to do that so intensively over such a long creative period would have been difficult to maintain. I think it's worth emphasising that his characters reflected real people and the lived experience in 17th century Spain. Characters speak in the way true to their age, sex and place in society. The settings for the action of the plays are realistic or reflect what the current thinking about a different location was. Even when his characters were indebted to earlier stock types, they display individual thinking as they react to the situations of the play. It's not that Lope avoided the kings and the queens and the other great men of history and society, but often they are minor characters, only used to bring texture to the play. Lope was self-consciously, and one might say with more than a little self-aggrandizement, producing a new type of art. He called it Arte Nuevo. And a central plank of that creation was that characters should behave and speak in a manner that is close to realistic. That meant that women should be treated with respect, lovers should behave passionately towards each other, the actions of the cavalier should be driven by idealistic valour, and the heroine, the dharma, should be beautiful and constant, but also passionate by nature. The drama of the plays is constructed around when characteristics like these are broken. So when a wayward daughter brings shame on the family, her father, uncle or brother has no choice but to seek vengeance. The defending of wronged female relations is a common plot, and the defence of a family's honour and place in society follows on from that. The honour culture was very strong in Spain, and depended almost entirely on the behaviour of women. Any hint of infidelity by a wife or other female family member reflected on the honour of the men in the household, and their response to that could be a violent one. Adultery was the single most serious threat to a woman's honour, and therefore to her male relations too, and murderous revenge was the ultimate way by which honour could be restored. This could extend not only to the revengeful murder by a husband of the man who was consorting with his wife, but by the murder of the wife too. The plays of the time, including Lopez, reflected this extreme culture and, to a very great extent, condoned it. But the women, and particularly the central dharma, are not completely without their own agency. There are times when resolution of the Dharma's dilemma is resolved by chance. But there are also times when she creates the extraction plan for herself. Sometimes this plan is then executed by her servant or lady's maid, but at others by herself. We have already heard that Lope was very attracted to women and they to him, so perhaps it's not surprising that the Dharma is often not only active in the drama, but the best-drawn character on stage. There are a number of Lopez plays that are drawn together to be classified as plays of intrigue. They were written at different points in his career and certainly not conceived as a group, but they are usefully pulled together to illustrate a particular feature, the Dharma in disguise, and more particularly, disguised as a man. This was not a completely new device, as it appears in some early Italian comedies, but Lupe took it and ran with it. Typically, the plot would involve the Dharma trying to resolve her situation, but once abandoned by her servant, takes matters into her own hands and puts on male disguise to enable her to resolve the drama. These plots revolve around mistaken identity, and very occasionally this is reversed, with a male character, usually the buffoon character, dressing as a woman. Lope often referred back to Roman and other classical stories in his plays and merges those with the retelling of more recent and more local historic events. An example of this, which also shows the powerful role women could play in his plots, is in the 1619 play The Sheepwell. The story looks back a couple of hundred years to the period when Ferdinand and Isabella were in the final stages of their attempt to rule the whole of Spain by wresting power from King Alfonso. The play opens with a military commander requesting help for the king from a local leader called the Grand Master. He says that he and his men are billeted in the local town of Fuente Vajuna, literally Sheepwell. In the town, the locals dislike the commander, who treats them roughly and issues commands to them just as if they were his own men. They want to be rid of him, but when the captain returns to tell them of a significant victory in battle, they all praise the commander and offer him gifts. 
As the townspeople disperse, the commander attempts to persuade two local girls, Laurencia and Pasquala, to stay with him, making his intentions towards them quite clear. But they escape. Meanwhile in Madrid, Ferdinand and Isabella learn of their defeat of their forces and resolve to regain control of the region. Lucrezia and her secret lover Frondoso are meeting in the woods when they see the commander out hunting. They hide, but Laurencia is spotted and the commander attempts to rape her. Frondoso jumps from his hiding place and grabs the commander's crossbow, forcing him to release Laurencia. Back in town, the mayor, who is Laurencia's father, is discussing the state of the crops with his alderman when the commander returns with some of his men. He attempts to persuade the mayor to allow his daughter to sleep with him, but is rebuked. The commander complains to his men about the attitude of the townspeople, but is interrupted when news of Ferdinand and Isabella's counterattack is delivered. The scene shifts back to Laurencia and Pasquala, who are being walked home by their servant Mengo, when Jacinta, another young woman from the town, begs them for help in escaping from the attentions of the commander. They escape, but Mengo is beaten up by the soldiers, and Pasquala is taken off to be a prostitute for them. Frondoso has been in hiding since the episode with the commander in the woods, but when he hears of the atrocities being committed against the people, he risks arrest by joining them. He asks the mayor for his daughter's hand, which, impressed by his courage and sense of honour, the mayor grants. Meanwhile, the soldiers are in retreat having suffered heavy losses against the forces of Ferdinand and Isabella. The commander suggests to the Grand Master that, given the way things are going, he should maybe swap his allegiances before it's too late. He returns to the town to regroup with the remains of his men, only to find that the celebrations for the wedding of Frondoso and Laurencia are in full swing. He loses no time in arresting the bridegroom. The third act of the play opens with the men of the town discussing what to do. The meeting is being held in secret, but an impatient Laurencia crashes into the meeting and with a passionate speech convinces the men to take their town back. Just as the commander is about to hang Frondoso, the crowd arrives, looking very riled up and angry. The commander says he will release his prisoner if he will go and calm the crowd. Frondoso agrees, but joins them and encourages them to kill the commander. The crowd rush into the house and kill everybody inside. At the court of Ferdinand and Isabella, the captain who escaped the massacre at the commander's house is appealing for assistance. The king and queen agree to investigate the matter by sending a judge to the town. Meanwhile, the townspeople are celebrating their new freedom, but they realise that there will be an investigation, so agree a story that they will all stick to, suggesting that it's the influence of the town itself that caused the commander's behaviour and his demise. The Grand Master hears this, but decides he cannot intervene against the collective power of the people, and decides to go to the king and queen to beg their forgiveness. The judge interrogates the people, but they stick to their story, and in his frustration he turns to torture. But still not one of them will be moved, and eventually he admits defeat. He returns to the court with some of the people to learn that the Grand Master has just been forgiven. The judge confirms to the King and Queen that his interrogations were unsuccessful and he would either have to convict the whole town or pardon everybody so he can take no action. The people then demand to be heard and tell of all the cruelty that they have suffered not just at the hands of the commander and his men but from the Grand Master and even from Ferdinand and Isabella through their judge who tortured them. The king and queen decide to pardon the town and agree to rule the town directly and fairly in the future. The Sheepwell is a play that looks like a historical drama, similar to many written by Lope, and a favourite form of playwriting in Spain through the Renaissance. But its message is more characteristic of a social drama about the struggle of the lower classes, so much so that it was something of a favourite for communist states in the 20th century, who liked a play that displayed the triumph of the united people over the aristocracy. All the characters with power abuse it, and the townspeople can only overcome this when they take on a collective identity and act on the promptings of a woman. The problem with the communist reading of the play is that ultimately they ask Ferdinand and Isabella to rule them directly because they will do it fairly and with justice. At the end of the play, there is no real change to anybody's class status or the hierarchical structures. 
Lupe's intentions were probably not so politically didactic. Picking up on an allegory that had been present in plays since the ancient Greeks, the simple but honest country people are juxtaposed with the city dwellers, and in this case military characters who are brash, cruel and self-serving. The younger characters are particularly strong in their criticism of the city types with their loose morals and hypocrisy. And of course, Lope always had to have an eye on how far he could criticise the monarchy, who had the power to shut him down if he stepped too far out of line. And here again, in this play, we see a strong role for a woman, perhaps surprisingly so given the place of women in society at the time. The women really have some agency here and are central to the plot. The commander is cruel to the whole town, trying to take his pick of the local women, but it is the attempt to rape Lorencia, her reaction to it, and his treatment of Federico, that is the root of his downfall. Without her intervention, the dithering and fearful men of the town would probably not have marched on the commander's house. And they play an important part in the discussions within the play that I didn't cover in the basic plot summary. Lorencia and Pasquale debate the value of men in an early scene and try to decide on the true nature of love in another. Perhaps most strikingly, it is implied that it is the women who wield the knife in the unseen murder of the commander and his officers. The question of the satisfaction of honour pervades the play. Almost every character has at least one discussion that questions behaviour in terms of honour. The consensus of the play is that the commander merely feigns honour and has none really, so his death is justified. Whereas Federico lives by his honour to the extent that he returns from hiding putting himself at risk when he hears of the torture being exacted in the town. The fact of his exemplary honour is even shown through his decision not to use the commander's crossbow against him when he could have, showing him as an honourable man of restraint and control. Some have also suggested that the crossbow has phallic connotations. It is used by the commander to give him an advantage when hunting, be that for animals or women. So three plays that, I think, show how Lupe matched serious intent with entertainment value. But for all of this, his work is not without problems. The attempts to merge tragedy and comedy can be dissatisfying in one direction or the other. Particularly when he attempted pure tragedy, he usually included comic elements that can jar. His tragedies tend to be inappropriately fast-moving and too romantic in tone. This and the rarely resisted comic touches mean that his tragedies just fall short of being truly great works. His other failings are practical ones. He wrote really quickly and therefore carelessly at times. There are plot holes in some of his plays and occasions where the plots are so contrived in pursuit of a happy ending that they break the bounds of credulity. The pedants might also object to the way he plays fast and loose with geography. He was a well-travelled man for his times, so the additions of coastlines to landlocked countries was not, we can be sure, done through ignorance. This is the case for Bohemia, and he was in good company there, as Shakespeare made the same geographic alterations in A Winter's Tale. Given his godlike position over the Spanish stage during his long lifetime, such liberties are understandable in the name of his art. While discussing Lupe de Vega, I've tried to avoid too many comparisons with Shakespeare, but there is one that just has to be made, as it serves as a good conclusion to this commentary on Lupe's work. Shakespeare not only conquered the stage of his own time, but has been preserved, reinterpreted, reformed and re-enacted over the subsequent 400 years, and not just in English. Throughout the world, where there is theatre, there is Shakespeare. But the same can't be said for the work of Lupe de Vega, despite his prolific output. His plays are rarely performed outside Spain, but he is influential. His vast number of plays reworked a few basic dramatic plots with ingenious variation, and permeated the theatrical landscape of Europe. His successors plundered his plots and reworked them for their own times for generations, to the point where some would not even have realised where these original plots came from. If we draw a family tree of the influence of plays born on the European continent, many, if not most, would find their way eventually back to Lope. This is his lasting legacy for wider European theatre, It may not be as obvious as Shakespeare's legacy, but
but it is important to an understanding of where European theatre went next. Next time, I'll be taking a look at another playwright of the Spanish Golden Age. Yes, despite his domination, it was not all about Lope de Vega. The next episode will feature the biographical details of Pedro Calderón de la Barca, who wrote one of the best-remembered plays of the period, Life is a Dream. And after the death of Lope de Vega in 1635, he ascended to the position of Spain's greatest living playwright. And in the meantime, I hope you enjoyed the special episode for the podcast's second anniversary that was released on the 3rd of May. If you missed it, you can find it on the website at www.thehistoryofeuropeantheatre.com or on the podcast feed. I've also put a few pictures related to that episode on the website blog page. There's a link to it in the show notes. If you would like to support the podcast, there are also links to ko-fi.com and the Patreon members area in the show notes. The latest members episode is called Alan Akebourne Gave Me Cheese and you can get access to that and all other episodes on Patreon for a small monthly fee, which goes towards offsetting the hosting and research costs that I incur producing the podcast. Thanks everyone for your continued support for the podcast in whatever form. Please do spread the word and help others find us here. I look forward to your company next time, but if you have any comments or concerns in the meantime, you can contact me by email at thoetp at gmail.com or via Twitter at thoetp. (laughs) 